Welcome everyone to this third panel of four, where we bring artists from the Phi Foundation's current exhibition, Relations, Diaspora and Painting, together with a special guest moderator. My name is Cheryl Sim, and I'm the managing director, and uh, I had the privilege of uh, curating this exhibition. And it's wonderful to see you all, and thank you for joining us. Today, we're delighted to have the artists Jordan Nassar, Kamruz Aram, who join us from New York, if, uh, yeah, and uh, Ginny Yu, who is in Ottawa, Canada. And I would also like to thank writer and scholar Tracy Valcourt for agreeing to moderate through the formulation of very richly composed questions. Let's just begin by acknowledging that the Phi Foundation is located on unceded Indigenous lands. The Ganyagahaga Nation is recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters of which we gather today. And Jojage, Montreal, is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. Today, it is the home to a diverse population of Indigenous and other peoples. We respect the continued connections with the past, present, and future in our ongoing relationship with Indigenous and other peoples within the Montreal community. Nous aimerions commencer par reconnaître que la Fondation Phi est située en territoire autochtone, lequel n'a jamais été cédé. Nous reconnaissons la nation Kanyagaga comme gardienne des terres et des eaux sur lesquelles nous nous réussons aujourd'hui, comme Jojage, Montreal, est historiquement connu comme un lieu de rassemblement pour de nombreuses Premières Nations et aujourd'hui une population autochtone diversifiée ainsi que d'autres peuples y résident. C'est dans le respect des liens avec le passé, le présent et l'avenir que nous reconnaissons les relations continues entre les peuples autochtones et autres personnes de la communauté montréalaise. And I'd just like to thank uh, Wahe San Tian Whitebean for the writing of this acknowledgement. So the way this event will roll out is that we'll start with a conversation based around Tracy's questions for about an hour and, um, and then we'll invite my colleague Rehab Essay in Toronto to lead a question and answer period where we welcome you to all pose your questions in the chat. So without any further delay, I'll turn it over to Tracy, Ginny, Jordan, and Kamuz. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, and thanks for uh, inviting me uh, to host this. And it's a pleasure to uh, just it's a real it's a pleasure to really just be able to connect right now and I think these kinds of conversations are very important in, in this moment in particular where we're, we feel maybe a little bit more cut off uh, from uh, from the personal and, and physical right now and I was fortunate enough to actually see the show um, in person and so that was amazing the, the show was beautiful and I, I was able to see it with a painter friend of mine and so but I'm, I'm somebody who's um, obsessed with perspective. My, my scholarship is around perspective, um, in particular aerial perspective, but this always has me looking at things from, um, from a variety of viewpoints. So I, I love being able to go into places and have that kind of technical knowledge given to me too, when maybe I'm looking at things from a more conceptual um, background. So, um, like, I just I want to say to Cheryl, if I if I could, just before getting into the questions, I just really love the kind of um, attention that you gave to um, the, the construction of the the show, which to me really um, paid homage to this idea of of diaspora, which is this kind of dispersal or scattering. And I think that there was just some really interesting conversations that were going on between the works and between the rooms, and and how that pushed out out beyond uh, the space of the gallery. And uh, so it was for me a, a really successful show. So um, to maybe just situate our questions today, um, I'll give a little background of, of my research. I've, I've kind of given a, a bit of an entry point already. Um, and then, so the conversation is going to take place around, um, mostly around perspective, space, surface, and I hope we will have some time for some um, discussion around material as well. So um, 
Yeah, my research looks at um, aerial perspectives of landscape. So this has me always, um, so, you know, in, in a sense, I'm, I'm looking at worldview and the construction of worldview. And I, I think that this is a really interesting, um, you know, way to look at diaspora too, of how we're seeing, um, you know, our different local worlds, uh, geopolitically, et cetera. And so in thinking about the aerial perspective, I'm often thinking about um, things such as vertical and horizontal registers. I'm thinking about the invisible and the visible. And I'm also thinking a lot about the difference between the way humans see images and the way that machines see images. So for humans, this is a lot about, um, we talk about qualification, we talk about context. And with machines, it's often about quantification or and, and category. And so this is another thing that I think that will be kind of a key word in our conversation too. something that I'm really thinking a lot about lately is this notion of category and who designs category and and then how to how to be do we impose, you know, notions of, say, uh, justice and fairness, who designs these words and then how do we apply them and, and the, the different kind of categorizations that are coming um, you know, that comes to kind of classify the world and, and makes up these, you know, composites of, of worldview. And I just, I saw this kind of, um, these kind of quadrants uh, in, in all of your work. And I thought that was very interesting. There was something cartographic about all of your work there. There was, you know, these kinds of squares, the grids. And so this is, was very interesting to me. And I mean, I got very excited just looking at all of your work that there was a lot of, um, you know, uh, kind of reflexive uh, conversations going on. So um, this is kind of where I would like to start is maybe a conversation around perspective and around um, the vertical and horizontal registers and, and how you all play with that in, in you know, particular ways. And, uh, you know, Ginny, maybe we could start with you and just the way that I know in your conversation with Cheryl that there was a kind of discussion around like, it seems like maybe there was like some kind of off kilter perspective the way your work was arranged in the space but uh you offer that this is not uh, you know off kilter that this is actually quite representative of how we move about in the world and i think this also can go back to this idea of categorization and of you know linear uh renaissance uh renaissance linear perspective of like trying to organize the world and like straighten the lines out and tidy it up and i think that you're all doing something really interesting with, you know, switching those registers around. And so um, maybe Ginny, we could start with you and, and then um, the others we could. Yeah, sure. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me and us to have this conversation. Um, I guess um, maybe I could talk about um, there are so many things that you just like, you know, like out there with like all these like really interesting avenues that we could take in terms of this discussion. Uh, but maybe um, which one should I begin with? Um, I, maybe I could start talking about perspective, like the way you were reading uh, perspective as the linear perspective uh, as invented during the Renaissance and that is used um, you know, very commonly these days in uh, image making or understanding visual literacy or whatever. Um, and it's interesting how what you are reading uh, my paintings, why does its lock fit my key um, as a linear perspectival thing. Uh, and it's, you know, when I heard that question, I was like, oh, that's um, because the way that I conceived of it is um, that the vertical lines are actually parallel to the lines of the wall um, and that the horizontal lines in the paintings are um, parallel to the floor. And so it was almost like a segment of reality, but it is true that, you know, one cannot escape this uh, linear perspective that uh, paintings do very often employ. And so it was, it's interesting to think about this kind of reality versus like image um, that the way that you've read this, um, this thing, it was really about like power reversal, like even starting with the question, um, you know, why should 
he always fit the law. Um, it's like a line from Toni Morrison's book uh, called Home. And so it's really about power reversal and, you know, and it is in a way based on linear, our reading of linear perspective in that, you know, you can read it as like us being in the corner or us being outside of a box, or they could be like three or four planes that are beside each other. And so it's just like a very simple play of uh, space and our reading of the space, which I think um, maybe I could sort of bring that into like your uh, discussion of categories, which I do have a bit of, you know, like categories. It's um, it's a big topic, but, you know, I, in a way, I think I kind of refuse to be categorized in a certain way. And it's interesting to think about diaspora in this sense, <laughs> in, in the context of this exhibition, because, um, you know, uh, for example, the poet Lee Maracle um, categorizes um, diaspora on the Turtle Island as anybody who's not indigenous. And so I think like there are so many ways of categorizing. And so I don't know, I think like going in and out of different categories and seeing things in different ways is something that I'm also interested in. And so I don't know if it, this answers your question, um, but let me begin like this. Yeah, uh, thanks. And, and uh, I will let uh, Kamruz and Jordan um, answer to it. And I would like to, to come back again, maybe in the question following, to kind of push this idea of, of, of categories again and, and, you know, those kinds of restrictions and, and, you know, who's developing the, you know, this kind of quantification that's happening in our world. And I think we, we've become very, we, we're having an acute example of this experience with it in the pandemic of how things have been, you know, our lives have, every day have become like suddenly, you know, very uh, uh, quantified. We're, we're, we're dealing with numbers and data and, and these things are not neutral. And so I think it's really interesting when we when we see how machine learning and, and kind of machine visioning is really, you know, it's starting to really occupy a lot of visual culture, whether or not we see it or not. But, you know, and how those kinds of categories are actually reflecting the kind of biases that are in society and actually accelerating them. And I think we can learn a lot about our own biases by, by seeing these kinds of articulations happening within text. So maybe after we could push this a little further. But, um, I don't know who would like to hop in now. Maybe just to comment on, on Jordan, I know that you're, you're playing uh, with the, the horizontal and vertical in the way that you're making uh, um, your, uh, your patterns, for example. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I feel like in my work, there's definitely that, like in terms of literal construction in, in a formal way and in, in a patterning way. Um, and it was pointed out to me recently that a lot of, you know, a lot of the patterns that I use from Palestinian embroidery are more often vertically oriented because of the way that the patterns are related to the human body and that they're on the dresses. So there's a lot more vertical space than horizontal. Um, and how in my artwork I kind of flipped that, maybe kind of, for me, it's not, it hadn't been a conscious decision. It was just, it made sense for like, since my uh, like area of interest is landscapes to make them horizontal because that is, that makes more sense for like a landscape composition. Um, but there's still, you know, there's obviously, I mean, in the process of making a work, there's the patterning process. And then there's the kind of painterly landscape painting process with color and, and the compositions. And there's definitely that period of working on the patterning where the choice is made whether to have kind of a variety of patterns, whether they're going vertically or horizontally and how that will affect that layer of the piece is like this two layer um, kind of effect. But um, in that, yeah. So when, I mean, when speaking specifically about like vertical, horizontal, like uh, I guess that's where it enters my work. Yeah, and I, you know where where I can also see really interesting things is that we, you know, we often think about um, we think about because you know my interest is in in landscape as well, and I think 
uh, an occupational hazard of that maybe is that I, I almost read everything in life through landscape. I, I'll look now, like if I look at the media scape, for example, uh, you know, sometimes I look at it and this is like a Dutch 17th painting of like, you know, things are just, you know, there's topics put there to make that topography interesting. And, and so, but also when I'm thinking about say landscape i'm also thinking about that kind of vertical mediation of what's happening you know between ground and sky and we think of often how like the world is divided horizontally like in terms of surface but there's also there's vertical layers too of, of ownership and you know that that plays into hierarchies too because my research also looks into you know how these aerial perspectives are are both representing and and supporting vertical power structures in, you know, all sorts of places in, in uh, you know, in, in institutions and in government and corporations. So, um, yeah, I, I have some place more to go with you again, like when we're uh, challenging these kind of categories, maybe I'll put it on pause and cameras. I, I see, you know, with, with your work, just those kinds of, there's these kind of really interesting negotiations going on between, uh, um, you know, the artifact, even like the presentation of the artifact, like the plinth and, and then the, 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 the painting behind. And there's that kind of conversation of, of going on between, you know, artifact, high art, painting. And, and I think there's some interesting conversations going on there. And I wonder if you maybe could speak to that. Sure. Um, so it's, you know, I make a lot of different types of work. So uh, the one that maybe we're referring to is uh, the sculptural work that's in the exhibition now. Um, but I can speak from, uh, you know, a different perspective uh, about the paintings. Um, and that kind of is a, an interesting segue using the term perspective that way, because um, uh, when you raise that term, I think of both perspective in the way that we study it in art, um, and art history and, you know, Renaissance perspective. Um, and I also think about, you know, perspective as in the uh, maybe subjectivity of the viewer from my perspective or from your perspective. Um, before, um, I would say like in, in the European tradition of painting, which is often under, understood as the tradition of painting, um, which is to this day Isabel Grau, who has a, relatively new book on painting uh, says in her introduction that I'm going to focus on the European history of painting. Um, there is uh, the first kind of rupture from like that European uh, or that Renaissance idea of perspective is uh, maybe Cezanne and then Cubism and then Greenberg comes along and talks about pictorial space versus illusionistic space. Um, but in Persian miniatures and uh, other types of painting um, from the non-European world, uh, the understanding of space was kind of put together in a, in a way that doesn't you know, fall into the Renaissance idea of perspective. And that was often seen as uh, those artists not being as sophisticated. So, you know, I think there's a kind of uh, maybe interesting Orientalist history there to uh, dig up as well. Um, Regarding the work that you mentioned that's in the show, I think uh, something that I think about often is the question of how forms become exotic. And, uh, and maybe that's the other use of the term perspective, like from whose perspective is it uh, exotic, from whose perspective is it kitsch, from whose perspective is it decorative. Um, so that's another kind of uh, point of interest for me. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I think all of your work really kind of grapples with those um, these kinds of hierarchies, right? And that that these are kind of these vertical and, and horizontal registers, and like so for for Jordan, your work, you know, that, that it's become the, this kind of needlework that might be seen as like artisanal, but is brought up, you know, is is framed and mounted in such a way that 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 changes our, our orientation to things and right. and I, and i think too about like how you 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 see you know the that kind of orientation to how you see something and how you appreciate it differently right. 
I, I recently um, reviewed, there was um, a Biennale, Biennale of Indigenous Artists here in, in Montreal. And there was some, it was, there was a focus on beadwork and blankets. And, um, you know, doing research for that, it was really interesting to listen to um, Salish weavers and, and talking about how they had visited a space to see a blanket and they saw it from ground level and then they they were able to walk about there was an, another floor above and they saw it was you know it was it was a whole other kind of pattern a whole other kind right. of landscape and i think right. it's really interesting and I, I think you've all done that in some way is that you've kind of forced us to rethink our kind of or invited multiple kind of orientations to things like Jeannie, you're putting things on the floor, uh, you know, like what does that say about the floor and and the you know the kind of hierarchy in in in, in actual spaces, right? And and you know how we kind of divide the world up into similar um, architectures and so um, maybe to continue. Huh? Yeah, did you have Wait, no, no, yeah, I, can, I just, uh, that makes me think of something very specific about this, this choice that you mentioned, because, you know, the work that I do with Palestinian embroidery is, it starts with clothing on the body, which is seen as artisanal, seen as craft, and, you know, it enters into the conversation of women's work and hierarchy and that whole history, but um, kind of separate from that, um, with my preliminary interest originally being in the patterning and the meanings of the patterns and also the composition and the language of the patterns in a sense, the systems and like how the patterns function in Palestinian embroidery. Um, the, the, um, I guess the, the idea or the, the, the gesture of flattening it out and putting it up on a wall or, you know, it, putting it on a stretch canvas. So um, the, the idea was to bring the pattern into focus. Whereas when it, cause it's, when it's draped on a body, you're not maybe necessarily gonna see the repetitions or whatever, it just looks like a pretty dress, you know? Um, and so for a way to inspect the pattern, you have to like flatten it out and kind of hold it up, right? And so that was, so in terms of perspective, it made me think of that because it's very much about, um, addressing parts of that um, medium that maybe become obscured in like the way that they're usually applied and um, and additionally in terms of it being you know present the, the work being presented as paintings was also about just about what I set out to do like I set out to make artworks and so I want the idea was to make something that would be assumed that it's an artwork right so how do you do that you stretch it on a canvas you frame it the people it reads as a painting because that's what a painting looks like that's how the paintings are presented that's how they exist right um and i think that also but i think that also for me it was like because the medium originates on the body and because i wanted to draw attention to the systems of the patterning the idea was to like distance it as far as away as it could from the body and make it less about bodies and more about patterns you know what i mean so again it's all about as you mentioned like controlling what perspective the works are approached from so to speak but yeah like you know i think um another thing that happens with so i, I mean i look at a lot obviously i look at a lot of images all the time and and this thing that that has happened to me like just it's just automatic now is that when i'm looking at an image okay i'm going to read the content i'm going to read okay there's there's a kind of story going on and there's that, that narrative and but i'm always i find myself constantly kind of stepping out of that frame too and trying to imagine the position of of the maker or of the photographer and for me uh, uh the, the kind of ultimate example of this something it's a picture that i go back to all the time is is bruegel's uh landscape with the fall of icarus because that perspective is this kind of like hovering viewpoint. This is not for me, it's not a situated, this, this, you know, this person is not standing somewhere. And for me, it's like a real kind of drone level of things. It's this hovering. And so, you know, I took that into like when, when I, when I went in to see the show and that kind of like, that's that, you know, that kind of one step back and, you know, and, and then being able to kind of step over again and seeing it from, from another perspective. And I think, um, it, my next question is kind of around maybe what I saw in all of your works is just like a real acute sensitivity to environment. Okay, so you have your work, but you have like, a, the, I really understood that you had a real, um, 
that that you really kind of had that acute awareness of that um that object or um, that experience within the space and i wonder if maybe you could comment on that with you know in the topic of diaspora as well as like how you know how that kind of acute reading of space might uh, contribute well um maybe i'll start because space is actually quite important for me and um uh, you i often in the past few years have uh, utilized exhibition design as a medium um and with the context of this exhibition that functions on two different levels uh, i was not present for the installation and i wasn't involved with the installation so i was not able to art direct the installation or to kind of make an exhibition design. Uh, they did use uh, a color that I often use in my exhibitions to kind of contextualize that particular work. But the works themselves also uh, exist as a context for themselves. And what I mean by that is that the object is presented in front of a painting. There's a geometric abstraction uh, that becomes the backdrop to an object the so-called decorative object kind of takes center stage and then the pedestal is very much designed and becomes an architectural element. So there's this codependence, there's this inter interdependence between the display, the object on display and the backdrop. All of this is something that I'm interested in in reference to what the museum does and how the museum, uh, the museum environment functions as a site for cultural representation. And there's a lot more I could, I'm going to kind of pass it on to the others because I don't want to just ramble about this, but there's a lot one could say about how a museum came, came into being and how museum designs and aesthetics changed over the years that you could see that, you know, pre-modern ideas of museums were very different than modern ideas of museums. Uh, but in each, situation you have these fragments from uh, art that was made by people around the world that were acquired through very complicated and perhaps problematic ways usually problematic ways um, and we can talk about that more later but yeah. i'll pass it on to the others yeah i could go like a lot of places with this but i'll let the other artists uh chime in because, like i'll just i'll just say one thing like when we're talking about maybe that just kind of organization of cultural spaces too and you know for me i'm always kind of flipping off into like that, that those kind of technical architect you know technology architectures and how they you know these are kind of neat and tidy spaces and and labeled and such and what happens to you know the artifact in the museum and often this becomes like relegated to like you know anthropology or what you know all these kinds of like really western defined um you know uh attentions to objects or classifications that yeah is very problematic and i think you know just finally starting to get some attention so. uh jordan or Ginny. But do you want to go ahead, Jordan? No, you go ahead, ladies first. <laughs> um, well, maybe like I thought while you're uh, asking the question, Tracy, I was thinking about this kind of differentiation between space and place and um, how me as in diaspora, as a diaspora, and I think um, it's not just me who um, who's uh, feeling this way, I think um, I feel very comfortable in terms of the, the notion of space. Um, but I think this notion of place, which is much more specific and less abstract and mo more concrete is something that is um, more comfortable for people who are anchored. Um, and I think that could be categorized or classified just to follow <laughs> um, the language that we're using here, like with settler or indigenous peoples. And um, the way that I was thinking about the world, worldview perspective, um, was like very much based on space uh, for, a while, for a long time until I started to think about uh, the specificity and particularity of my situation here on this unceded indigenous land working and living here. 
And then it sort of flipped into me thinking about this place as like a very specific uh, place. And so that was kind of an interesting switch for me um, that happened uh, when before I was kind of roaming around and uh, considering space. Um, whereas now I'm more considering of the place and all the histories that went through here and all these kind of hierarchies or events that one could, I guess, um, categorize or place in vertical form in, uh, if you're to draw some kind of di historical diagram, it would be um, vertically placed. Uh, whereas if you switch the perspective and look down upon it, then it kind of flattens and becomes like, a, you know, like layers of illeg illegible or something that is more legible than others. And so I think um, I sort of these, these thoughts sort of came to my mind. Um, and in the work that's in the show, um, I do have this, um, I'm orienting people to look at uh, and feel um, the ground first. And so this very clear writing that is, uh, you know, opposite to, in terms of specificity, opposite to uh, my paintings that are um, non-representational. Um, uh, you know, I'm kind of orienting the gaze so that we're looking at the ground and we are aware of where we are. And these paintings that are, you know, painted on untempered glass that are um, semi-transparent in some parts and some parts um, you can see right through them. And so I'm kind of thinking about all these um, things I use, Tracy are very much interested in, um, and all of us seem to be kind of dealing with. And so, yeah, I just wanted to kind of mention the, this kind of difference of space and place that I've been um, thinking about when I began these two bodies of work I'm presenting at the Bai Foundation. Yeah, like, I, you know, my, my head started, like, you're nodding uh, uncontrollably for a minute when you start talking about these kinds of, you know, this flattening of space from, from above. And I'm you know, like, this is something that I, I look at all the time, this kind of, we call it like the nested view. So this kind of compression. And so when you, and you've, there, you've taken away this horizon line and, and, and now you, you're, you're, you met with abstraction and you kind of met with these like open theater spaces for someone to kind of, uh, you know, recount a narrative to you because maybe we don't have that kind of visual language. And so somebody kind of assumes that, that narrative for us. And that's, you know, kind of omniscience. And, and then we think about the stakeholders of those, those images and, and who are, you know, telling these stories. And, and it's not a multiple voice. And I think this is what we are interested in here in, in multiple perspectives. So. Um, yeah, Jordan. Um, I guess for me, like the pieces in, in terms of like, like my works in terms of the space, the embroidery works um, really are self-contained in a sense. Um, and that's kind of the idea is that um, there is, I think less than relating to the space, like literally that it's in, it's more about relating to like Palestine as a place but in terms of um, like the imagination of that place on behalf of members of the, of the Palestinian diaspora. And so it's kind of like, um, you know, I, I think I was, I was having a conversation the other day about um, what culture, what your culture means to you. I'm second generation Palestinian American. So uh, I'm quite removed from, the experience of like living in Palestine that my ancestors had and and my understanding of that culture has basically been focused on material things right so it's it's not only artifacts and things like the embroidery and stuff like that that you know objects that you'll have in your house and then like food and music so in, in that sense like cultural um artifacts or objects but uh so so in my work you know taking that embroidery that is something that is kind of standing in for Palestine, like in our homes and stuff, like whether it's the pillows or like a wall hanging, but then, you know, in my artwork, kind of projecting that place onto it in a sense and having it be more explicitly like representing Palestine for me <laughs> or being Palestine, you know, and in terms of the landscapes themselves, 
you know, I'm not basing the landscapes on any particular real world vista. It's more about the idea that um, for a member of the diaspora that's never been to Palestine, Palestine could look like anything. It becomes this fantastical imaginary place, right? Um, and is that just kind of lives in these like special objects that we like surround ourselves with because we're not there, you know? Um, and so in terms of uh, what Ginny was saying about like specific place, I feel like that and my work kind of participates in that conversation. Um, but then of course, you know, and, and, and I think that it can apply in a universal way for like a diaspora experience. My diaspora experience is Palestinian, so it draws, so the medium I use draws on my particular culture. But, you know, it's kind of the same notion of this faraway place that uh, is like a place that exists in our imaginations. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, I, I, would, I would like to um, maybe now um, shift over to like maybe move a bit more towards materials and surface and because I would love, I think Jordan, you speak really well on, I, I can see you get really excited when you talk about material. I listened to the conversation that you had with, with Cheryl and, and, you know, I think it's really nice to really talk about material along with, um, mm -hmm. uh, with concept. And, and this is something that I always, is, you know, when I'm talking with my students about about writing, it's just that kind of like, you know, to, we like to be, we need to be rooted in the concrete too. We need to be rooted in that kind of description and the material and, and you know, concepts are always so seductive, but um, that, you know, I would like to maybe just actually talk about the materials that you're all using and, and that maybe I would actually start with, with surface. And I think you all have a particular relationship with, with surface. Um, Ginny, you talk about, you know, the aluminum and, or the, and the glass, I think the glass, you know, this untempered glass and the kind of precariousness to it and, and the kind of relationship that's happening, you know, on, on levels that we can't see, like chemical levels of like what's happening, you know, between the kind of paint that you're using and, and the viscosity of things. And, and then Camus, I'm, I, I see this, you know, in these kinds of material aesthetics in, in your work and in, in a kind of archivist sense of like, you know those kind of traces of time and and, and in that interview uh, you had spoken about uh i think it was a, a vase you saw in hong kong and that it was it was being um you know advertised as like something authentic but it it was you know in your like it was clearly not like you know authentic but those kinds of markers around it that kind of suggest some kind of authenticity and, and those kinds of traces and then uh, Jordan, I think you have a particular, those, you know, the kind of relationship that you have with your surfaces, you know, you're, you're constantly breaking that surface and then revisiting it again. And, and, you know, it's such a meticulous, like to have like such an intense relationship with that, with that surface. And, um, you know, that you're kind of, you're also trying to control that surface and you, your, your work is so precise and, um, so uh, I don't know, maybe Jordan, we're, we're, I'm looking at your eyes. Yeah, yeah, I'll, let's start, I'll start. <laughs> maybe you can um, respond first to that. Well, for starters, I'll say that I get that fabric there. So that when I, when I visit, um, there's, a, there's an old fabric store in Jaffa that I go to that um, is like the old fashioned kind. And so that's also something that this material that I work with and the surface itself is from there so that like, is really just a sentimental thing for me. It doesn't really affect the artwork, it, except for that it's the nicest fabric I've been able to find. It doesn't affect the look in terms of like, I could use any unbleached cotton fabric. Do you know what I mean? Um, though I will say that it's very hard to find an even weave like that. So maybe there is something about that particular fabric. But um, but yeah, I mean, I actually haven't thought about, I thought about a lot of, uh, I'm sorry, I've thought a lot about it in terms of, um, because the embroidery actually is three-dimensional slightly, like it's raised, there's raised stitches. And so in terms of, I was thinking about this before, because in a very literal sense, in terms of perspective, like literally as you move past a piece, if you look at it like from an, a deep angle, not straight ahead, you lose sight of the pattern and the colors really become like very, um, like, blocks of color and then as you move forward like towards it the color kind of disperses and the pattern really pops out because you can see the back the background fabric because when you do it from the side you really can only see the raised stitches 
And so there's something like literal about that that I like actually. And I feel like um, makes the works fun to be around in person because you notice different things at different angles and stuff. But, um, but yeah, this idea of, of piercing it, I hadn't really thought of it like that, but I guess, I guess I just feel like very intimate <laughs> with the piece because it's like on my lap for maybe a month while I'm working on it and it's all rolled up like so I can work on like one particular corner of it or whatever and um yeah just like constantly the needle going through it either way so like I think that there's um it doesn't really become now that I think about it it doesn't really become a surface until I stretch it yeah. do you know what I mean like before I stretch it when I'm working on it it's literally here it's like a soft thing that is amorphous and doesn't have, um, is not, I wouldn't call it a surface, but then it becomes a, a flat surface. And then you can really see like, you know, while I'm working on it, it's the patterning is obscured by all the folds and the flowing of the fabric. And even the landscape composition itself, like you can't fully appreciate it until it's framed because then everything gets oriented and straightened out and then, so there's kind of this, it's a whole like little lifeline, like lifetime before it arrives at like the completion um, and becomes what it's going to be. But anyway, that's my two cents. I, just, I have to just say like something that I, when you're saying that, I was like, yeah, do we ever think of clothes as surface? And you know, right. and like, you know what, right? Like, I mean, what, like- Right, I, because I, you I need to, if like, you're if you're embroidering on something, you have yeah. to think of it as flat, but yeah. then when you're putting it on the body, it gets, yeah. That surfaceness gets like obscured. Yeah. Um, I don't know who would like to uh, speak next on the kind of materials and um, surfaces and. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, well, you know, I, I hesitated because I can actually, I probably can say too much about materials and um, I, I'll try to keep it kind of brief and maybe we can discuss further if there are questions. Um, I, I think being trained as a painter um, and um, being trained in that history that I was speaking about earlier. That's the history of European painting. That's essentially what we're taught and what I teach. Uh, uh, there is, you know, while we're talking about the diaspora, there is this displacement with, uh, you know, someone I, I was an immigrant child who came to the country and, you know, loved, uh, it's the same thing as wanting to be in a rock and roll band, you know, like can, an Iranian guy with a funny name be in a rock and roll band, you know, um, uh, at least not maybe in the 80s or 90s in, in the Midwest. Uh, so, you know, there is this kind of coming to terms with the materials uh, by being um, not, by coming from an, a culture that was supposedly not engaged with uh, that history, right? But I think that that's a very simple way of looking at it and that uh, the history of painting is much more complex than that. Um, the other thing that I'll say, you mentioned the vase that I saw in Hong Kong, and uh, that has to do, I, you know, again, all of the work comes out of painting and the uh, sculptures I found through, by necessity, uh, the content of the work kind of took me to sculpture. I started making uh, collages at first with uh, pages of books. Uh, there were catalogs documenting ancient Iranian art uh, that were published before 1979, which was important for me because that was the date of Said's Orientalism publication. And uh, so using these sort of nostalgic images, which were also made in a very modernist style. So the photography of the objects that were displayed uh, had, uh, you know, ex either it was black and white with a lot of contrast and a direct light source, or with uh, bright red or blue backdrops. Um, and I started, that's when I really started thinking about the way that objects are contextualized and the way that we see these objects as essentially contemporary objects. Um, to make a long story short, when I wanted to place these collages into an encyclopedic museum, I ran into a hurdle, which was that most um, curators of Islamic art, curators who were not contemporary curators, whose education was not modern and contemporary art, um, thought it almost 
offensive what I wanted to do, that I wanted to kind of play around with the collection. Um, they wanted what I would think of as more neo-Orientalist uh, ideas of what would belong in the galleries of Islamic art in an encyclopedic museum, with the exception of a few um, like the Met who do engage these things. Um, so I came to sculpture because I wasn't able to find a place for the collages in the encyclopedic museum, and I decided to bring the museum to the objects themselves. So a lot of the materials that I engage in the sculptural works, the linen that is, you know, what we understand as Belgian linen the, that painters know as the linen that you paint on, also reflects the linen walls of the Met or the, um, you know, this kind of old school idea of the uh, neutral space in the museum. And um, and the architectural materials using terrazzo, using um, uh, you know uh, hardwoods and brass uh, to build a sculpture, are also relevant for me because I think they reference the um, uh, more kind of maybe modernist museums and um, and so I'm interested in playing around with that. I could go on and on about their ceramics, and we'll leave that for another time. I could too. <laughs> <laughs> there's so many places you know that i just want to like latch on to but yeah just one thing i would like to just comment on because you know we were talking before about this kind of this idea of neutrality and the museum space being like neutral or and and you know it just so in the same way that we think of like say technology or data being like neutral well you know these are like we really need to reconsider what these what you know what who's defining neutrality and and uh and so yeah i mean i just see there's a you know there's a lot of you're referencing so much in your work you know of that greater architecture of uh, of art history and of of the classification of art and of museum spaces that is really uh, for me gets me very excited when I see your work. So and again, and I think that that, that right like, and I think that that history that you know going back to the history of painting and what it means to be to make paintings. You know, I continue to paint with in oil, and which is something that I was really challenged on when I was in graduate school. Um, but uh, you know, that's something that I see also in both Jordan and Ginny's work, which is like, you know, renegotiating that history of painting or kind of entering that, uh, entering painting from um, another perspective, which, uh, which I think is, um, is, an, an, is a useful contribution to that history, is an important yeah. contribution to that history. Yeah, definitely. And just maybe yeah. to link it to like what you were saying, uh, cameras, um, I think like, you know, when you think about surface, I think one could maybe think about how the surface appears. But then if you think about how the surface is built or what is really the surface, we see what is beneath it we see what is reflected on the surface or behind the surface and i think that also goes sort of hand in hand with this idea of flattening um you know hierarchies or flattening uh, layers um and i think in painting uh it's uh, sort of if you think about this kind of more illusional spaces that uh painting some paintings uh create that is sort of another type of way of thinking about surface and image. Whereas if you think about painting as material, like materiality of, you know, um, these pigments that are on top of like certain sur surface, um, certain material, which is, you know, on top of something else and so on. I think then it's kind of another understanding of uh, what painting is, but in a more kind of concrete and like uh, physical way. And so I think surface is kind of an interesting to think about because in one hand, it does not exist. Whereas on the other hand, that's all there is. And so, yeah. You know, I think about this um, in writing too sometimes, you know, when, when something is so good, you, you forget, you forget somebody put those words down you know you kind of forget that there was like an author there that created like and it, like the words just become you know uh like so impressive like so like kind of material in that way and uh i i think Ginny, when you're talking about um 
about surface that, you know, like, I think it's just, it's so much about relationship too, of like, you know, like I was really interested in the particular, you know, I think you had a very acute idea, like a very precise idea of the kind of, uh, of the kind of finish or what, you know, how you wanted that surface to interact with, with the materials. And, uh, I think this is just, you know, those kinds of relationships sometimes when we see, maybe when we look at paintings of that, of that product, which is, you know, just like, it is just only the surface of it, right? Like there, there's so many like interesting conversations that are happening on that technical level. And that they are like these kinds of really layered things that as we talked before, that kind of nested uh, view. And, and I think there's, you know, we probably don't have a time to really get into this, but, um, Julie Meritu had talked a lot about, so I, I got the opportunity to write on her painting Mumbo Jumbo, which is in the show. And, and she, she spoke of this kind of like this analysis that was happening on the same level as, as making and that this becomes like, it was a way of kind of unpacking her identity. And I'm just wondering if, if, if we have time maybe for this is like, you know, how much kind of, you know, do you, do you find this kind of analysis happening within your work when you're, when you're actually making the work or um yeah absolutely i mean i think um this kind of layering can happen uh within a painting um uh it could also happen within some kind of space it's in and so when i am showing these uh, paintings kilted is the word you used um is you know it's really kind of it the image within the painting is uh beyond the frame uh itself and so in, in in a way it is very much kind of related to the space that it's in um and um that together with the per, uh, perpetual guest uh works that are on the floor we are very much aware i i wanted to be more uh, very aware of where i'm standing and with that line um uh that i uh wrote um or I put um, a perpetual guest on the unceded Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe um, uh, territories. Um, I wanted it to be very much related to the space, but it, but it's beyond in a way, like it's within the painting, but also beyond the painting in that you look through and, you know, I kind of even question what is uh, really kind of what is the limit of painting in the sense that you know is it like the limit of the sheet of glass that's on the floor or like is it where we're standing and where does that belong to and so on but then you know you kind of uh, you look through the sheet of glass and you look at these uh, cylind cylinders that are um, supporting the sheet of glass and then you're aware of the floor you're aware of your like presence on the on the in the space and so I think it, you know, in different ways it's related. Um, and I really kind of do think about me uh, being uh, here as part of uh, sort of the fabric. At some point, you know, I, I go between like feeling not belong, that I don't belong to, like I belong to, I don't belong to, you know, I go back and forth. Um, but um, I do think that it is constructive for me to think about my being here as uh, uh, sort of seeing it uh, in relation uh, to where, to the history of this land and, you know, how to kind of navigate um, living together on, on this land um, or on earth uh, for that matter. And so, you know, I think it's kind of related in so many different ways and not just on the surface of the painting uh, for me anyways. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I, you know, when you, when you say like, where does the painting end? Like, I think about this too, of like, you know, where does that composition end? When did it, where, like, I think of it as, you know, that kind of powers of 10 sort of articulations of back. And, and when you think of that kind of like, if we think about diaspora as something that's kind of like outward pushing or expansive, and you think about like the placement of all of your works, like it kind of, you know, in, in conversation to one another, but how that little square fits into the, that bigger square of like, okay, here we are in the space and here we are in old Montreal and in old Montreal extends up, you know, and, and all of that. And, and I think all of your work really kind of, you know, speaks to those kinds of quadrants of, of space. And, um, you know, Camus, I think you do it in by taking like those kinds of, 
uh, you're speaking to the parts of the whole when you're looking at parts of architecture and removing those parts of architecture and putting them in other architectures and and again you know how these things take on on new meanings like that and would you be willing to maybe just, I, there was a really I don't if we have time there was a, just a really interesting conversation that you and Cheryl had had around the mirab and the that like taking that kind of architecture out of like the traditional space of the mosque and then moving it into that the museum and yeah um sure i mean on you know on the one hand there's a kind of nostalgia there's a cultural nostalgia connecting with something um from the city that um that i grew up in uh that my family is from um uh, at the same time there's something kind of violent and disturbing about the displacement of this object i mean it's not just an object, it's a piece of architecture. So I would say that, um, you know, I was talking to a student recently and I, I, was, I was talking about archeology span and the, the history of archeology, span uh, how, how these digs took place for these objects to become available to all of these museums. And when they weren't stolen or looted, they were, you know, deals were made with the rulers of the countries. And um, I, the, student was interested in uh, said something about oil and i was thinking about the oil trade and <clears throat> how you know the history of bp british Petro petroleum uh in iran and um its relationship to the coup of Mossadegh, which was um uh, the cia uh, led coup of Mossadegh, which was the uh, democratically elected leader of iran um, who had nationalized oil so you know the shady rulers of the countries all had deals that they made um, with uh, uh, um, both oil companies and uh, people who wanted to, uh, and archeologists, arch archeological digs, um, without the permission of the citizens of those countries and really without um, benefiting the country, you know? So, you know, I think there is something in that history that's, uh, that's really disturbing, but at the same time, I also find, um, some perverse comfort in going to that uh, place in the museum and uh, spending time uh, with those objects. Mm -hmm. I think, I think this is, and I think we've all maybe gestured at that. And Ginny, I know you've you've made comments about these kinds of histories, these layered histories, and I think these are part of like when I'm looking at visual culture and being, which are like the things that are visible and, and and not visible and i think these these little these, these kind of histories are, are these kind of you know these parts of these invisible art articulations that we're maybe not aware of but like you, you know there's there's all these kinds of layered narratives that contribute to a particular material or space or and how all those kinds of you know when you have knowledge of that and how that affects the reading of things too i think is interesting and often we're just not privy to those kinds of and, and i would even i would even add that you know in the painting coming back to like the process of of painting and the materials of painting that the layering of of paint can you know i kind of think of a lot of my paintings almost as um this may be a stretch but a form of history painting that there is that uh, uh, not in the kind of uh, art historical definition, but you know that they talk about their own histories. They have a history of being built and destroyed and rebuilt, um, erased and redrawn. Um, and uh, um, that process of building and destroying the image, the idea that every painter essentially, every, every painter is um, engaging in the process of uh, accumulating marks on a surface essentially um is interesting for me yeah i mean i could go like for like i think that that's really interesting these kinds of marks on a surface i don't know if we have time for what i would like to ask jordan one last thing just maybe about because i know there was a reference made to um like when we're you know i guess we can talk about the stitches as kind of like mark makings on on your work but and it, it was also there's um you know a, a reference made to the pixel in each of those stitches and I think this also ties over to something Ginny had used, said that like almost everything has something uh, like is three dimensional. When you break things down to their kind of most basic um, um, constituents or the kind of foundations of things that, you know, everything is kind of three dimensional. And, and it's like, 
it's that kind of flattening. It's that kind of perspective that can flatten things out. And, and, you know, state seeing, for example, is one is, is the kind of seeing that is, is made to, you know, slim, simplify narratives and, and take away the kind of nuance and, and kind of, so it promotes a kind of sim simplifying of story. And this is what, you know, is, is you know, our, our worldviews get kind of explained to us by omniscient people like this, but Jordan, I'd just be interested to maybe talk, uh, again, on that more material level of like, um, you know, th those kinds of, in, when you, when you're breaking down your work into those, like those tiny, those, those, those kind of like, I don't know, like little microscopic gestures and, and, um, and I know you share your work too, that you have, you have, uh, other people working to doing the pattern. And so there's, a, there's a kind of, um, it becomes a kind of communal, uh, enterprise too. And, and so again, this is for me, this, like the zooming in, zooming out kind of thing that I, I tend to, um, do with most everything. Um, I mean, essentially, you know, at the end of the day, it's about, um, I think when it comes to the embroidery process for me, there's two things going on. Like, cause the patterning process happens like earlier, right? Like I might, I might conceive of a, like a new body of work and plan out patterned patterns for like the whole body of work, you know? And then, but at that point they're just black and white they're just literally providing myself with like the pixels, so to speak, uh, with which I can then apply color and using different colors, make a composition, right? And so um, after the patterning process is done, it, I, it's what I imagine is a very painterly process of just having an image in my mind of like form and color. Um, and so in a sense, each, each little stitch, um, it's the kind of thing where there's like all these kind of micro decisions to be made because at the end of the day, if I choose one particular stitch to be part of the sky or the mountain, it's not really gonna affect the piece at the end of the day, but like each little decision adds up and then that becomes like the shape of the mountain, you know? So it's, it's this back and forth between, as you said, like these very, very small, gestures and then it making up you know one piece will have anything from 50 000, oh from 10,000 to 100,000 stitches on it you know um and so and so in, in that sense also like the pixel element like the pixel the, the comparison to a pixel also provides me with like the more pixels i have the more detailed i can get right um but i think that um yeah, in terms of that relationship, I think that, um, I mean, for me, actually, it's it's such a different experience to see a work when it's photographed versus in real life, in a good way. Like, I like to see it photographed because it flattens it out and you really can see the landscape in a different way than in person. I don't know, there's this other back and forth and it's not about um, which way is better or worse or whatever. It's just like, total, I've, I, I definitely... Um, perceive it as like very distinct experiences to see one in real life versus uh, an image of it because I, I like the flattening at times. Like I want it to be flat. I, I want to zoom out and see just like the bigger shapes and the pattern gets kind of too far away to really examine, you know? Well, like for me, there really is like, there's so much of like kind of that satellite image of landscape in, in, in this work. And that, you know, on where we are, uh, how do we say, uh, at the mercy of politics of resolution, whereas, you know, a citizen using the, the internet, we have a, we have a limited kind of uh, um, resolution that we're going to see if we're looking at sort of, uh, you know, a digital image of, uh, we're looking at aerial right. maps or, uh, and whereas the military has access to, you know, much more acute kind of resolution. And I think that this is interesting how like, you know, in person we, we have, when we see this work, we can move in and we can see that those like, you know, how the kind of pixel kind of corrupts. Like if you ever go on like on the New York Times or whatever, they have those interactive, uh, you know, digital stories and you can move in and you can only get so 
close. You're like so close, and then the pixels corrupt so that there's that kind of right. expectation, and then it's like okay, you're you know there, there's a kind of boundary to to know it. Right it becomes more confusing than anything. And then you're like, did I gain anything by getting in that close? Like, do I, do I know anything more? Like, and um, I just think that like, there's something, um, you know, and then when you change that kind of media and the kind of, uh, you know, the kind of media manipulation that happens too in that, that kind of like in-person experience of things. And then when it becomes that kind of mediated images and all those kinds of articulations that can take place. And, and when you think about like, um, you know, when you see digital images of the world now, you know, when they're they're the new uh, blue marble, for example, like these are composite images, right? These are like one image after net, like taken like 365 days of the year. And, and I think there's, you know, there, there's something, kind of similar happening right. maybe in, in all of these works and these kinds of layerings that are taking place at like very kind of meticulous and seamless levels in 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 some ways and uh you know and these are all kind of convincing arguments to for us to to understand the world how it really is this is how like the earth rise image was first promoted to us and but this was how america presented the world to us so I think again, I'm always going back to okay, this is you know these kinds of perspectives of like these compasses, you know, compositions of the world that each of you are offering really, um, you know, interesting um, uh, iterations of worldviews. So I, I guess maybe now I should allow for some questions to be posed. Uh, rehab. Hi. Yeah, so I received one question. My name is Elisa Francilda Cardoso. She's a PhD student in uh, Portugal and Coimbra. Uh, and I was asking a bit more about the, um, how would we explain um, the oriental input and in art representation that is still sort of still very present in in exhibit in museums, such as the exhibit she's referencing is The Fabric of India in 2005 at the uh, VNA Museum. If someone wants to discuss a bit more, it was specifically talking about sort of European and Asian diaspora being sort of still showcased as um, currently art, currently archival, and artifact. I had a bit of a hard time hearing the question, but. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I'll repeat the question again, no worries. But I don't so, know, maybe this is something more if one of the panelists had um, understood the question. Yeah, so basically how can we explain the still, I mean, the oriental input in art representation that's sort of still very present in the exhibit, and such as the exhibit of uh, the Fabric of India in 2005. Um, I think it's a, just gonna look at it. I think it's a, an exhibit that sort of showcases arts, but also showcases artifact in the same space. From what I understand. Do we mean the, the um, what, what do we mean by the um, Oriental input? Um, I mean, do we mean like the Orientalist input? Uh, I think for just is she's basically bringing further like, isn't that still a kind of neo imperialist representation? I mean, sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, this is, <laughs> yes. Yeah. It, it's funny to see uh, when you go, um, uh, I remember during the um, early 2000s after the invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq, um, that there, uh, they would have these shows at the Met. They had a big Afghani show at the Met to show Af Afghani work. Uh, objects and carpets and uh, fabrics uh, from Afghanistan, and um, and in the end they have a gift shop where you can buy like um, uh, you can buy your like little uh, hat or scarf, um, you know, to match the fabrics. I mean, this is this this is um, how do I say this like politely? This is like so problematic and weird and kind of. Um, uh, dark in a way to uh, you know it, it's a it's a really perverse way of trying to um, showcase a culture that your country is destroying you know so um, I mean there's that I don't know about the exhibition if it was 2005 I mean that's a very long time ago I bet you could find one 
that's uh, 2020. Um, I guess maybe one that's currently that like would sort of showcase a similar example is actually in Montreal, the at the Fine Art Museum, the um, L'Art Nouveau. So like uh, the L'Art de Tout Monde. So basically, it was an exhibit showcasing uh, placing art pieces and artifacts in the same space, specifically categorized per area of the world. So placing, yeah, artifact of like Arabian culture. I think, uh, culture. you know, I would, if, if I there were a person that, um, my friend Sadia Shirazi, who's a, a curator who's written a lot about this kind of thing, I, I, I wish she were here to answer this question. I don't, I don't know if any of the other panelists have, have uh, a comment, but um, uh, for me, it's, you know, some people like Sadia really, really do believe in breaking these categories um uh, altogether uh the idea of identifying art by its region or its uh, nationalities is something to be undone yeah absolutely i think it speaks to like the categorization that we were talking earlier you know and geographic categorization is um uh you know i think uh less and less relevant and I think in, in that way, thinking about diaspora is, I think, more interesting. And thinking about diaspora as in, you know, the way that Lee Marco said, um, anybody who's not indigenous being diaspora and all these kind of overlaps that are happening. Um, I think it's interesting to think about the world, categorize the world, maybe not, not even categorize, but see the world in that way. And, you know, um, instead of uh, somehow these uh, rather artificial geographic boundaries or, you know, um, which is reality, but I think we don't have to stick to that. We don't have to, uh, we can refuse to see things that way. Um, I think that's maybe more of my question. I'm kind of curious to elaborate on that. So like what would be in that case in the, just to discussing a bit like the piece of imagination of an artist um, how can we sort of like institute or we uh, um, bring some sort of change in this uh, institute of categorization and display? Um, how can we approach it in a way that still sort of feels respectful for each culture without having to show an artifact of a culture that's not dead and like still belongs in a, an object that is active and useful? Um, well, I would really like to hear actually uh, Jordan speak to this because there's, um, you know, when, when we're talking about uh, 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 the cultural origins of objects, you know, when we're talking about like Afghanistan, we're talking about, you know, uh, dozens, if not hundreds of cultures and shifting boundaries and so on, so on and so forth. I'm just, um, you know, when we're talking about Palestinian, um, uh, uh, Palestinian um, uh, stitching as a tradition, I mean, there's obviously like a much different history there that uh, should be acknowledged. So I'm actually curious to hear Jordan talk about that. Right. Well, you know, honestly, I, I approach it from a like, you know, my work is about the diaspora experience, the, the effects of being part of a diaspora on your experience of your culture, which is that like, it's kind of not my culture, even though it also is my culture kind of thing where my, I, I'm not from there. I feel like a total alien when I'm in Palestine, even though I love being there, I, it's just like not where I'm from. Um, and how, as I mentioned before, like those cultures get reduced to these like material items and objects or like tangible things like food, or whatever. And so on the one hand, there's that where it's like, my understanding of Palestinian embroidery might be flawed or incomplete, but that's like what I want to, that's like purposefully incorporated into the work because it's discussing that like, you only can understand your heritage so much when you're not from, you're not raised within that environment and in that place, right? Um, with Palestinian embroidery, it's fairly, like, cause there's similar embroidery from all over the world in terms of cross stitch, um, but especially in the region. And there are certain, you know, it's also, you know, it, it just, it, it's also, it's such a moving target because depending on when you're talking, different countries were different places or in existence or not or whatever. And so like in that region, for example, like 
what we call Levantine or an Arabic Shami is like Palestinian, Jordanian, Syrian, Lebanese, like roughly because pre 1900s, it was all greater Syria or this or that, or all these different cut up zones and whatever. So it's just like, even that is so like, there's very similar embroidery in Jordan and in Syria. Um, and they, they have different aesthetics slightly. Like uh, I find that the Palestinian, for example, is very grid oriented and the Jordanian has much of the similar patterns, but they go, uh, they're not on a grid in the same way. And so there's these little subtle things, but so, you know, but, but anyway, sorry. But uh, getting back to the point, which is that um, the Palestinian border itself has become such an emblematic representation of like something Palestinian, Palestinian culture. And um, I think part of that is also speaking of place is that each pattern um, or many of the patterns have distinct relationships with specific villages. And so that locates the maker slash wearer um, or locates that person's origins. And so that, again, when you're talking about, you know, with Palestinian diaspora, it's not just diaspora, it's like expelled diaspora, right? And so there's this extra aggressive impulse to hold on to like specificity of like where you're from. Um, and I think that that's part of the other reason that Palestinian embroidery became such an emblematic representation of Palestine is because there is this, it holds on to specific villages as well that maybe don't exist anymore. Um, well, what I, was, um, what I was getting at, and I kind of is, is you know, kind of this idea that um, some people would like to uh, present that there's no such thing as Palestinian culture. And so like these, right. uh, these kind of um, signifiers of Palestinian culture, you know, you see like, uh, I've, I've seen I have a, um, Israeli friends who've shown me these postcards that say like, you know, falafel, Israel's like right. uh, national food or whatever, right. you know, and how uh, forms, foods, culture, uh, cultural kind of uh, signifiers become um, uh, right. uh, at stake in a place where right. um, some people would have that there was no such thing as right. Palestinian culture. I know? mean, you know, the, the thing about all that stuff for me is like, um, this embroidery has been done in that place for a long time by people of all religions, right? So. 200 years ago, let's say, or 100 years, like pre-Israel, pre-everything, there were Jews and Muslims and Christians in that area between the Mediterranean and the Jordan River um, doing this embroidery. So it's, it's now it has become a symbol of Palestine, as in not Israel, but actually it exists outside of that dichotomy in a sense. Um, and... So, you know, again, with the moving targets, right? Like, what are we, like, what it's, it's it, when you apply it through this lens of um, the Palestinian uh, struggle for, you know, independent freedom, whatever, everything, um, it gets a different light shown on it than, like, historical accuracy, in a sense. It becomes, and similar with the food, like, if you go back, like, I just, I, you know, there's, the huge debate is always about hummus, right? Um, and, <laughs> and obviously hummus is like from the region, but has been eaten in what is currently Palestine and Israel for thousands of years, like chickpeas and tahina and whatever. And so, like, you know, by every culture that has controlled that area, whether it be Ottomans or Romans or Egyptians, like they're, they're all of them have eaten hummus there, and so why wouldn't Israelis also? Like everyone who's ever lived there has always eaten that, basically. Do you know what I mean? So it doesn't shock me that there's such a thing as Israeli hummus, you know, because it's 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 name person occupying this place hummus. Like it's always you know there's always going to be hummus there. Um, the other thing I will note, interestingly as well, is that. You know, the, a lot of the, I don't know why I'm going into the hummus debate so much, but <laughs> I feel like it, it values mention here. Um, the aggressive, like, Israelification of things like that is a very American phenomenon. And when you're in Tel Aviv, they say, let's go eat Arab food, and they mean hummus. Like, Israelis aren't pretending that it's Israeli food. 
And, you know, they come to America, they see Israeli falafel, Israeli hummus, and they're like, what is that? Like, they're like, is it Arab food? You know what I mean? And so I feel like a lot of Arabs and Palestinians in America feel like it's being taken from us and whatever, but it's very, it's Americans that are doing that. It's not Israelis there, which is a whole other thing. But um, I don't know. I think that, I think that, as I said before, the, the fundamental thing for me is like, you know, sometimes people in seeing my work might question the, that authenticity and if I'm doing it the right way or like I'm not even from there and that whole thing and that, you know, ironically is like my whole point with these and, and, and also, you know, as you said before, you were talking about Orientalism and it's about that for me is very much too, which is like examining this phenomenon of like me being Arab and also me being Orientalist <laughs> and how that can possibly exist in the same person. But of course it does because I'm American and my notions of what is Middle Eastern and what is, you know, in exotic in that way are based on American stereotypes. And at the same time, I grew up with a lot of that culture and identify with it but it's like those both at the same time and like um it's not always like a bad thing or you know it's just the fact of life the fact of diaspora i know Um, cheryl had a question but if you do allow me cheryl to like further (laughs) push that point (laughs) i don't have to ask my question if you want to keep on going i'm like maybe (laughs) um i think it's just because I kind of really relate to that as like, I'm born in Morocco, but I grew up all my life here in Canada. And yes, I sort of like do have this idealized um, idea and it's sort of really based on nostalgia of what is, what is Casablanca and like food there and family. And it's just so linked to that. Uh, but it's also, I just, I feel like it's just completely untrue anymore. Like it's been 10 years I haven't been there and it's just like my vision of it is completely distorted by these memories and sort of how to still like be authentic and genuine about it without sort of having that orientalism, imperialism, materialistic. So I can pronounce it wrong. <laughs> Lens. Uh, on well, I just, I, I feel like the, the orientalism <laughs> thing is like, I feel like it's, I mean, it's kind of what I was saying, but it's like, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just a fact of life in a sense. Like for people who are like, as I said, like my, I mean like my Orientalism, mm-hmm. orientalism as an Arab yeah. American, you know, mm-hmm. where it's like, I'm not, it's not a malicious thing and it's not a miss, it's not a like uh, fundamental, like fundamental not understanding, like, I guess, we're talking about classical orientalism (laughs) like that okay i get it's problematic um but identifying those things in ourselves where it's like i am informed by stereotypes about arabs that we have in the west i recognize that it's not that you know what i mean it's just like something to i guess it's like as long as you recognize that and you're aware of it then it's less like um harmful in a sense and, you know, for me as an artist, I like make work that incorporates that. And, like, I'm, exam- I'm like examining that and paying attention to that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's very different for yeah. you because you're, you're born that, you know, for me, there's, there's like three generations of distance, mm-hmm. you know, so it's totally a fairy tale place for me. And it's like, yeah, anyway, we're way no. over time. <laughs> I'll shut up. I'll shut up. <laughs> Um, no, yeah, Cheryl, first, it's been so long to pose your question, please do. I want to hear it. Well, it might just be a lot like this, la- this last five minutes. So, yeah. you know, I, I've had this question that I've asked to Kamruz and, and Ginny, but I, I would love to also hear Jordan's take on it because, you know, you work from a pictorial uh, abstraction. So the question is, um, you know, in consideration of the canon and um, the uneven power dynamics that underpin this kind of validation of painting forms, um, who can participate? I would like to hear, um, I was kind of dreaming of hearing you all talk about the power dynamics of working through abstraction in particular. Great question. And, <laughs> and who gets to, yeah, who gets to participate? Who, what are the expectations and what is the burden? And then again, I guess a, a, a kind of representation when, um, you know, people 
of color, uh, diaspora people want to work in abstraction, what you can reveal, what you can hide. Love to hear what you have to think, say about that. It's a great question. Um, I, I don't know if any one of you would like to start. Uh, I, oh, I to. You're starting. Okay. <laughs> Go for it, Jenny. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I think at some point um, I was thinking of like, because, you know, I, I did start when, you know, we all start when we're kind of younger than, than, than we are now. And so at some point, you know, there's that kind of the, the abstract art and then you're trying to sort of understand it and then get into it or be accepted or whatever. But I think at some point it doesn't really matter. Um, uh, how it is uh, really sort of evaluated or categorized, I think what matters more to me is sort of mm, me having a conversation with, it's, it kind of becomes not sort of like this entity, um, abstract entity that I uh, wanna belong to or have, but you know, it's more, it becomes more like um, uh, in relation to, so my work existing, me making work um, and those works existing in relation to whatever that's around and sort of um, seeing that um, not necessarily something to get into, uh, but in conversation with. But I think also kind of thinking about abstraction, I, for me, um, and I said this before, I think it's easier for me um, to conceive of uh, things in abstract way and it goes to pattern uh, recognition, you know, with this kind of zooming out from particularities, it's easier to see things in abstraction and then, uh, you know, when I recognize the situation, then do something about like sort of being able to sort of navigate in that situation. So I think abstraction came to me fairly easily, particularly because of my position as um, sort of diaspora. Um, uh, which I think also, as you say, was I think presented um, some difficulty getting into like sort of the, the, the accepted form of abstraction or whatever. But I think um, for now, I think it's more interesting to have a conversation with and um, going my own way in a way. Thank you. Yeah. So maybe it would, well, something I can um, say is just um, when we talk about abstraction, uh, what are we really talking about like formalism? Uh, in a way, I think about, um, you know, there's, uh, there's a book on my shelf that I'm looking at right now that is a catalog from the Inventing Abstraction exhibition from uh, MoMA from several years ago. And um, some of the critiques of that show were that, you know, this is um, situating the invention of abstraction between 1910 and 1925 in Europe. Uh, so, uh, you know, the relationship that one might have, and I, I want to also talk about identity politics because I'm, I, I tend to shy away from identity politics. Uh, I find them often to be problematic, um, but I also want to maybe distinguish the difference between how one is identified versus how one identifies. Um, so uh, for example, I can walk down the street um, in New York and I'm identified as probably a Middle Eastern man. Um, when, uh, when I walk down the streets in, in Turkey, I'm identified as a Turkish man, although I'm not. Um, so, uh, you know, I think formalism and identity is also something that's interesting to me. And it's not about whether I have permission to be a formalist, whether I have permission to make purely abstract Greenbergian paintings. It's, uh, it's not about whether I give myself that permission, it's about whether the culture at large accepts that from me. Um, and I've seen this so much in art schools where um, students who are people of color, who are non-European students, try to make abstract, purely formal, purely Greenbergian paintings. Now, while we might have problems with those for other reasons, the critique that they often get is, uh, 
well, why, why aren't you talking about your background? Why aren't you talking about your culture? Why don't you do something that's more reflecting who you are? Um, and so I think that that kind of uh, dance between like self-identification and how you're identified by the culture at large uh, is really important in how one forms as an artist and, and was certainly important in how I was formed as an artist. And going towards abstraction, you know, it's like, as uh, it's, it's, well, I don't want to go there and I don't want to take any more time. <laughs> 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 All right, then. No, I, I mean, this is great because you, you bring up uh, the burden of representation, but also the burden of non-representation as well. Um, and, and that those are very loaded things. And, and we can we should always continue to talk about it. I think these are perennial questions, but maybe just to, um, we'll tie it all up. Jordan, do you have any thoughts on, you know, and I, and I understand also that what's problematic about my question is like putting us into categories. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, well, I don't know. I mean, for me, my personal experience with like attraction in my work is that I'm trying to fighting against it in terms of like, it is, it is more natural for the medium to it, it it's harder to make something form it's harder to make a landscape on a gridded embroidered pattern right so it's actually like the challenge is to execute something that isn't totally abstract you know um and so for me but i think that it's interesting because it's like you're relating to what you were just saying is that like essentially what you're saying is that if you're white you, there's this blank slate notion where you can make work about anything or whatever. But then if you're not, then you're supposed to make work about that experience because it's, you're not a blank slate, right? So there's this like notion of that. But for me, I think I'm going the opposite way, which is like, I am, I look white. And so, but I, I was raised with Palestinian everything at home and everything in this big Arab family in, in New York, but it's still here. And so my, whole thing is like wanting to you know this this half classic like half something experience of wanting to be like accepted and included as like enough of that and so for me it's more about um yeah I think like like I, when I was younger and I started making work and whatever it's like it was about wanting to connect with my Palestinian heritage and wanting to participate in something Palestinian and so on and so forth but it's two sides of the same coin of like you know um, who's allowed, like, you know, in theory, as you were, uh, like, based on what you were saying, I would be allowed to make a completely abstract work because the world sees me as white and so I can do that and no one's going to say, like, but what about this, you know? Um, but I'm doing the opposite. I'm making work that is giving me that identity that people don't read, but that I do identify as, you know? So it's, anyway. That's my two cents. <laughs> yes, and I want to thank you all for um, contributing, you know, to the you know, to the to the reality that art can do so much. And um, this conversation has been extremely valuable to me. Um, Tracy, thank you so much for your questions and you know for getting giving us. An, an opportunity to unpack these questions around materiality and surface and stuff that we don't always get to in the individual interviews as well. Uh, Rehab, thank you as well for your interventions. I really appreciate you being with us on every panel this way. Um, we're also live on YouTube. So thank you folks um, tuning in there and, and everyone who joined us today. This, uh, this um, panel is recorded, of course, so that um, folks can can um, have a sense of and, and come back to it. And this is a very valuable archive for us. So thank you again for being in the show, for putting your trust um, in the foundation and for being so generous, really, with your time today and, and your you know, participation in the discussion. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Take care. Let's hopefully see each other in real life someday soon. <laughs> that would, that would be great. That would be, yeah. be nice. <laughs>